Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And as I'm sure many of you know, I am a gamer. It is a bona fide fact at this point. From my early period throwing knife montages to my entourage on GTA 5, my gaming skills are seldom equaled and certainly not by anyone who I am covering today. I am the epic gamer your parents tell you about so you better hide your wife. And in true gamer fashion, we are going back to the world of video games with one of my most requested topics of all time. And that topic is Yandere Simulator, an anime-based game. Ah, uh, anime, my favorite. What do people who like anime talk about? Hello, fellow anime watchers. Ooh, ooh. I'm going to level with you guys here. One of my most commonly asked questions is if I watch anime, and although I have seen a couple movies when I was younger, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, I haven't really had the chance to enjoy much of it. Although I have heard great things and I really do respect the art, some of it looks truly beautiful. Now, anime has been relatively popular since the early 20th century. It obviously originated in Japan and often represented the cultural zeitgeist. The development of digital mediums has allowed the art to flourish and expand into new genres. One of those, of course, is the video game genre. There are many anime video games, and it was in the video game heyday of the 1980s that anime-inspired video games and video game-inspired animes rose to prominence. Since then, their popularity has continued to extend beyond their borders, with the style attaining international prestige amongst a variety of audiences. I also want to take a moment to talk about manga, which is typically used to refer to comics and graphic novels often created in the Japanese style. Manga precedes anime, and although mangas may be made reflecting an anime style, they are by no means the same. However, there is overlap, and that overlap can be demonstrated in many characterizations. This is where we meet the Yandere. <laughs> Yandere is a portmanteau, which is our word of the day, of the words Yandere and Dere Dere. Yandere meaning sick and Dere Dere meaning infatuated, deeply in love. So combined you reach the lovely idea that a person is in love to a sick extent. They will do anything for their senpai, even if that means often less than charitable activities. This personality trait is attributed to manga characters. However, it has gained popularity in anime as well, with many characters being modeled around that mold. The psychotic behavior, often paired with a cute design and sometimes demeanor, seems to be a good contrast that has become quite the rave. But it wasn't until one very cheeky game developer had a very cheeky idea. How about we make a whole video game from the perspective of a Yandere? That cheeky game developer was a person by the name of Alex Mahan, currently operating under the very fitting name of Yandere Dev. He was an independent developer hailing from California. He has a degree in animation and was previously known under the name Eva Zephon, where he'd worked on the game of Lunar Scythe. However, in spite of receiving some initial interest within forums, it didn't come to fruition. That was previously his most renowned project, but he has been a resident of the online world since the mid to late 2000s, working on various concepts. One I found was a game called Shader. Lots and lots of fun. It appears that Yandere Dev was a man with many ideas. So let's talk about the idea that has brought us to this titular game. He conceived the idea of Yandere Simulator in 2014, pitched it to the internet, and allegedly after receiving positive feedback, decided to initiate development starting a YouTube channel to document this development and progress. The YouTube channel, like all channels, was a bit slow at first, but in perspective gained subscribers at a relatively rapid pace, catapulting his content and the respective project into the public eye. It wasn't too long before other larger creators gave the game a burst of publicity, including PewDiePie, Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, and I has Cupquake. Given its accessibility, even in the early stage of development, Yandere Simulator was pushed towards the spotlight. And although it was not remotely near finished, many were more than willing to let this slide considering that it was an independently funded venture. And sometimes true quality does indeed take time. He would typically upload content that would provide updates and ideas and was interactive on social media. However, it was a lot to do for one person. With this in mind, in 2014, Yandere Dev also set up a Patreon to support this endeavor and it gained a reasonable amount of donors, at one point totaling $5,000 a month. With the production in full motion, new ideas ready to be worked on, plenty of traction and support from the community members and even the odd volunteer along the way, everything seemed to be going perfectly fine. However, if it was a perfect story, we wouldn't be here today.
If you went by his YouTube channel, it's unlikely you'd see many issues. Yandere Dev has now amassed over 2.6 million subscribers. His content appears to receive universally positive feedback from his audience, and his subreddit is a place of joy and epic anime memes. But this hasn't changed the fact that there have been many videos equally well received, dishing out some hard-hitting criticism and numerous threads outside of the Yandere Dev chamber. You see, our friend Alex here seemed to have a lot of creative ideas, which definitely gave hope to the project on principle. However, as time passed, in spite of the notion that these ideas were receiving support, many began to become frustrated with the lack of progress being made on the game. One year passed, two years passed, three years passed, four years passed, and people didn't feel like they were seeing results. Now, many games take a long time, and with one developer, it was obviously not expected to be completed too quickly. Rome wasn't built in a day. However, many began to challenge whether this project was comparable to Rome, or whether it was more of a, well, Pompeii. With criticisms going after his management, development, and even basic ability in the pursuit of this vision. There were a diversity of criticisms to cover on this front, but many also claim that Yandere Dare's response was regularly documented to be lacking the filter that many creators may have when dealing with criticism. This led to additional criticism for his demeanor and attitude, with many stating that his hostility and often censorious response to criticism shows an arrogant and entitled side to him that he hadn't earned yet. Others who defended him said his responses were just those by an individual under a lot of pressure to deliver a game that has been weighing on him for a long time. Add this to a load of other drama regarding attitude and treatment of those around him, responses, alleged harassment, all escalating in severity, and you ended up with a very messy case indeed that came to a head in the year of 2018. If you're confused, don't worry, I'll do my best to get through all of it, and maybe we'll make some more friends along the way. Full disclosure, Faf9, my good collaborator friend, put out this tweet which did significantly well in the Twitter sphere. And in a reply, he then stated that I was making this video, which led both Yandere Dev and a prominent critic of his to reach out to me. Overall, they had quite little impact on my script, but as always, I will put it out there and I will clarify that unless you're someone like Austin Jones, I'm not here to bite your head off. There's going to be a lot of criticisms and opinions from me, but as always, I encourage everyone to form their own. I'd also stress that some of this criticism is retrospective. You'll know by the tense I use. There is no guarantee that individuals involved feel the same today about a lot of these things, but these incidents have had a butterfly effect onto the current situation and thus cannot be ignored. Now, let's talk about the video game that was almost completely derailed by internet drama. Ladies and gentlemen, it's game, game time. time. Given that the root of this video is the game and the origins, I think it's most appropriate that we begin there. Yandere Simulator as a concept was conceived around the 2014 period. Now at first Yandere Dev was a one-man band, working on the project. He may have had a lot of drive, it's hard to tell completely. In a late 2014 interview with Tech Raptor, he seemed to be pretty motivated. He had some decent ideas of what he wanted to do with the game, even if they weren't fully realized. But you don't exactly need them to be at that point. He also appeared to genuinely enjoy enjoy interactions with his audience over the delightful medium of emails, stating that it filled him with joy. At the end of the interview, he committed to making a game that would fulfill expectations and not let anyone down. But that is easier said than done. Projects on a large scale are always a challenge to an extent. You would inevitably go through periods of high and low motivation. Developing a game is never an easy process. However, there are also things you can do to facilitate the development of a game to maximize the efficiency and to make sure you're able to turn out high quality product in good time without being sidetracked by menial issues. These are all important aspects of management without even considering PR. PR meaning that you need to build hype and turn out content that eventually justifies the hype. Now, Yandere Simulator is clearly a neat concept that is popular with many people, but it's also just a game, and given the fact that the developer hasn't exactly released any other acclaimed work for people to build off, in spite of its popularity, a trust in this developer and his ability to deliver a game has to be earned. With the almost immediate success of Yandere Dev, on principle, it seemed like there was a lot to celebrate. When a concept is popular and takes off, you have a lot of momentum, and a lot of people and businesses wanting to provide their services. However, if you're not prepared for this success, then it can yield many problems for anyone. 
Probably one of the best examples of this is child stars. Now, children need to be represented in media to an extent, and many of them deal with it reasonably well. However, for those who have been thrown into the spotlight at such a young age, whether it was due to a hit song or an iconic film performance, many don't deal with the sudden spotlight and pressure too well. Many end up in rather uncharitable places. In many instances, it's the case of peaking so early and having so much pressure to maintain that. In other cases, it's simply not being prepared for the responsibility the success brings. Although Yandere Dev is by no means what one would consider a child star, the Yandere Simulator's spontaneous success was somewhat equatable, and I don't think Yandere Dev was remotely ready for what it meant, not just as a creator, but as the developer of a game. Although the 2014 origin was pretty relaxed, 2015 was met with a huge spike in attention, with the aforementioned creators showcasing the game to millions of fans. Publicity can be premature, and for Yandere Simulator, it was. Let me explain why. As noted, the build-up of a game is partly about hype. Typically, the discovery of a new game or a new piece of media will lead to a process where we either discard that discovery and leave it behind, or we become more invested and we fall down whatever rabbit hole that game has. Nonetheless, it's unlikely our venture down that rabbit hole will last forever. Eventually, we will hit a wall where we can no longer find any new information, and the information that we already know no longer engages us. For some people, this takes longer than others, and in a way, that's all right. Now, when we hit that wall, we have one of two responses. We can leave the source of what we know behind and continue with our lives destined to fall down another rabbit hole eventually, or we can try and obtain new information by either creating it ourselves or trying to get it from the creator. This is often represented by the sentiment of impatience. I'll return to that soon. However, I want to make the point that although Yandere Simulator was an interesting concept and it was great that Yandere Dev had a lot of support in developing it initially, Yandere Simulator wasn't developed enough to be deserving of the publicity it received. Yandere Dev had very ambitious ideas for the game. At the time of the game, although you could roam around and do a few actions, some of which were fairly brutal and amusing in their shock value, there was no deeper substance. This meant the game built hype almost immediately, yet off the back of mostly very super official elements that wouldn't keep people engaged for a prolonged period. With the hype and the influx of new donors on the Patreon, Yandere Dev felt the pressure to maintain that hype, but as said, it's equally a PR job as it is a developer's job, so he liked to document progress, which is a time-consuming venture. In the short term, this was a sensible decision to make, but it could only work out long term if the decisions that he made were backed by his ability. The decisions you make early on in the development of a game can have long-term effects at a later stage. You're setting the foundation foundations. On top of this, as documented in a later video, any possible overhaul of the game seemed troublesome because the dev was worried that doing that would kill the hype. The game is only alive for as long as people are interested in it. If people lose interest in the game, it's dead. If I release frequent updates, people will remain interested in the game. If I release updates slowly, people will lose interest in the game, and the game will get closer to death. Given that so many people had experienced the game in some capacity, he clearly saw it as a challenge to revive the hype if he lost it. On the surface, many people would just see him as trying to resell the same product and wouldn't buy. I'm not going to go into complete depth regarding why his decision to continuously work on the project, since to maintain hype was eventually what has fundamentally crippled it, will cross that bridge when we reach it. However, as is inevitable, eventually, even if you're adding content, if there is no clear compilation of a plotline or overarching concept that people feel satisfied with, they will begin to become frustrated. Results are important. This was a huge problem for Yandere Dev as he clearly prioritized certain components that although may have provided progress in the moment, didn't necessarily provide the feeling of progress to his audience, particularly regarding the rivals, which to many was a significant selling point. Many people began to hone in on the fact that they didn't feel that Yandere Simulator was making the progress that it should have, with focus being overly centered on trivial matters and Easter eggs. This led to a basically placeboed sentiment of progress. The project felt like it was moving forward, but not in the ways that people would want it to. And by 2016, people were becoming restless, not just in the game's development, but in Yandere Dev's responses to these frustrations. How did he handle them? Well, let's talk about it. Now, Yandere Dev is an interesting person. 
His past shows that he was never the most socially apt. And when you watch his videos, you receive the impression that he isn't a massive, people-loving extrovert. So it's clear that he wasn't used to this level of positive attention. What this can do to a person is often varied. But given that he was always a bit of an oddball, the outcome wasn't exactly favorable. It's hard to say exactly where the switch was flipped, but at a point the feedback he received was no longer universally positive. He just stopped taking it with the decorum that one might expect him to, and when questions started being asked, they looked to you to answer. And let's just say he didn't exactly provide the desired responses. Arrogant is a word I see used a lot, and honestly, I completely understand why a lot of people had that opinion. Particularly in 2016, there are multiple screenshots of him being incredibly short-tempered with people who were making inoffensive to good-faith criticism. He likes to use the word stupid a lot when describing anything he doesn't like, which in the wrong context can come across as rather superior. He would regularly clash with fans and critics alike. There was one situation where a fan was using a mod, and in response to this, Yandere Dev kicked them from the game and left him an interesting message. Honestly, the video is a bit pissy, but it's obviously just a fan who's annoyed. And as videos go, it's fairly mild-mannered. It'd be reasonably easy to defuse as a creator who the fan probably looks up to. Instead, Yandere Dev responds by going on an angry diatribe about how this guy's a dumbass and he can F right off. When asked to justify this on Reddit, maybe saying, oh, it was just a heat of the moment thing, he stated that he was a passionate guy. He didn't really see any issue with that tone because he's a person who puts his all into this game. But it's not that simple. You can work hard on something, but that doesn't give you free license to be a colossal dick about it. This is what people mean when they speak about arrogance. They mean this attitude that someone is entitled to behave in such a way because of a greater cause that they are participating when those things are not connected at all. You're not above certain principles of and sometimes as an adult, as a public figure, people will hold you to much tighter accounts. This was a pattern with Yandere Dev. I could go all over these examples, but I'd just be repeating myself. He frames it as honesty and him speaking his mind. But being honestly unpleasant is still being unpleasant. From the position he was in, it came across as arrogance as well. And as we'll find out later, when other people were unpleasant back to him, he didn't take it well. Nonetheless, this isn't my favorite example because eventually he didn't just go from responding badly to audiences who were impatient, he went to blaming them altogether. Until recently on the Yandere Dev wiki, it stated that Yandere Dev is best known for working really hard. It's almost like Yandere Dev wrote it himself. Well, it's possible he did. However, as mentioned, many people have doubted that, given the slow progress. But in 2016, he decided to finally explain what was holding him up. What was Yandere Simulator's biggest problem? Well, you might be surprised. In this now removed video, Yandere Dev blames emails for the prevention of progress on the project. Yes, emails. You're probably sick of hearing about it by now. I'm certainly sick of talking about it. I'd love to stop bringing up this subject, but that can only happen when it stops being the biggest problem I'm facing. In fact, he stated that he spends 8 to 12 hours a day on them. I receive an avalanche of emails every single day. Depending on how much email I get, sometimes I spend between 8 and 12 hours going through my email, leaving me with no time left in the day to write code for the game. Now, this is where the contradiction appears because you must be thinking to yourself, well, these must be important emails if you spend so much time on them. Well, they're apparently not. When you send me a stupid email, you are actively sabotaging the game's development. If you want this game to come out faster, you should not email me unless it's absolutely necessary. In fact, throughout the video, he brands a high majority of these emails as stupid. He goes through each category of stupid emails. I do wonder how this video flew with anyone who isn't stupid, because there is no way that this makes any remote sense. I strongly dislike this video, whether it's the floating screen demon or his incredibly condescending tone, like he's talking to a bunch of 12 year olds, though. He might be, I don't know his audience. That's my feelings. But even feelings aside, this was about as watertight as the Titanic. Post iceberg, of course. The emails that I receive fall into five categories. Volunteers, 
bug reports, questions, suggestions, and fan works. I don't understand. Firstly, I'm surprised and somewhat skeptical that as many people as he said emailed him. Secondly, if so few emails that you receive are worthwhile, although they can be irritating in the moment, what was stopping him from either not bothering to open them or just opening, seeing what it's about, and once they've been deemed stupid by his standards, closing them again? Stupid emails should take less than 10 seconds to check. And doing the maths, that means he was getting through a lot of emails in a day. And I found it hard to buy that he was just engaging with every last one. If someone volunteers to help me out and they don't include any examples of their previous work, I immediately delete their email and move on to the next one. I'm not going to waste my time typing an email that says, I don't know whether or not I want your help. I haven't even seen what your work looks like yet. Show me what your work looks like first. Oh wait, he does that too, so he might just be held up by the volume of emails. How many emails would he be receiving though? If he was receiving emails from so many people offering to volunteer, maybe he should have a volunteer for his emails. The video seemed like a rather mean-spirited way for Yandere Dev to scapegoat his own audience as the reason for his shortcomings. It's basic management, and blame your audience because you can't handle it is just daft, implying that they are sabotaging the development. It's ridiculous. Making a simple request for less emails is fair enough, but telling people that sending emails is ruining the progress of the game is not just blatantly untrue, but do you not know about the Streisand effects? Why would you bring more attention to your emails? Pretty sure the Yandere simulator demographic aren't the biggest users of that medium of communication. Why would you remind them that it exists? It's like Superman making a video about how people shouldn't bring kryptonite near him. It's a waste of time. He wasted his time making a video about how emails are wasting his time. Stop. Stop right there. After two years of this nonsense, I've already heard every single possible suggestion about how I can solve my email problem. There is no idea that you could possibly suggest that I haven't already shot down. So don't send me your brilliant ideas for how to solve my email problems, because it's not going to work. The only way you can help me solve my email problems is if you stop sending me emails. You can see what part of time management I'm not really a fan of on his behalf. Even if the video is not intended as a scapegoat, it's clear he cares too much about things that can be handled fairly easily. As noted, he definitely has his limitations. However, capability to not spend whole days on going through emails should not be one of them. Of course, he didn't recognize that, and after listing out all the ways you shouldn't email him, does actually address some of the rather unpleasant interactions that he's had. However, he does it by making a monologue about how he's descending like some kind of anti-hero over Beethoven's number no. seven symphony as if the boy thinks he's slick. You know, there was a point in time when I was a very nice and patient person. But working on this game for the past two years has been very stressful, and it has sucked all of the niceness out of me. I no longer have any patience left. I've started responding to emails using very harsh and abusive language. I'm not proud of myself for doing this, and I'd like to stop, but it has become impossible to control my temper when I'm subjected to the same stupid garbage every hour of every day, despite the fact that I constantly ask people to stop. I'm only going to get grumpier and grouchier and angrier the longer this goes on. Please stop sending me stupid emails. We all deal with stress in different ways, and it's okay to open up about these things, but Yandere Dev has a way of doing it that just seems to push blame onto other parties, even those who may admire him, and he's just so unnecessarily irritable that it makes it very hard for others to empathize. 
This was the first time it appeared that he had made a seemingly direct video addressing these issues, and it didn't give me hope for the coming years of research. It seemed to lack a sense of responsibility and understanding of the life he's living and what comes with it. But it was about to get even deeper than that. But let's talk more about his time wasting. I think this was somewhat deeper than just that though, and I want to talk about the nature of time wasting and why he was doing it. Yandere Dev had a problem known as chronic justification syndrome. It is the motivation to respond to every single criticism and suggestion to give the impression to your audience that you are on top of everything, you are in control. Do I think he's exaggerating in his emails video? For sure. I highly doubt he ever spent 12 hours a day on his emails, but it wouldn't surprise me if he did go about responding to various people who didn't require responses. There are more reasons for this that I'll also divulge soon. As a creator, you have to understand that with an increased audience, you will undoubtedly not be able to respond to every single person who criticizes you, because it is terrible time management. But also, unless you actively enjoy it, it's a mentally depleting activity once you reach a certain size. So wrapping himself up making videos, going through emails, is obviously going to hold you up. Yandere Dev clearly feared people having an image of him that he didn't desire and therefore wrapped himself up in so much drama that it was almost laughable. Another heavily referenced example is this one where he exchanges an email with someone from the wiki admin team. I think it was Yandere Dev Wiki. Once again, I don't know the exact context of this, so I can't say if he has a point or not, but it doesn't sound like a particularly necessary problem. It's a case of control. He likes to control the narrative regarding how people perceive him. This is probably because in 2016, he was called out for his previous persona, who went by the name of Eva Zephon. I think that's how you pronounce it, though I could be wrong. And how this person had behaved in communities. Honestly, regarding this whole discussion, there's a lot that, you know, I'm not going to hold against a person. All I'd say is he's quite strange, and I think many people felt the details were a little discomforting. There's a whole additional drama attached to this, which has been covered in some other very in-depth videos. He used to be active on the delightful hub of 4chan, which is where he originally pitched the idea for Yandere Dev. However, they had a field day with this situation and a fair few others. So now he hates them, despite the fact that he made the quote, most anti-SJW game in existence, and they rejected him. What a sad story. There were a few more serious claims we'll briefly touch on now, most worryingly was the claim of paedophilia, for which his response left me feeling a degree of confusion. There's been a lot of discussion about whether he was in favour of certain less than palatable activities, though he does seem to have clarified them now. He also responded to the claim that he'd received news from an underage person, and I mean, it's all rather incoherent, it does seem like he's just adjusting a statement to the tune of the criticism that he was receiving, but there's not really too many more details to this. There was one account against him, and although a detailed testimony, there's no verifiable physical proof, so do with it what you will. On top of this, there was a pastebin detailing what is allegedly him trying to groom a younger individual, but pastebin's format doesn't make it a particularly reliable source, unfortunately. Now, it's fair to say that Yandere Dev is a strange character, and his internet history is not flattering to say the least, but it's also because of that that it's not entirely clear if or where the truth ends and the lies begin in this case. We've seen a few situations where strange behavior is escalated with additional claims that turn out to not be entirely true, which is why it's hard to speak conclusively here. However, there is something conclusive it can tell us. Simply put, with all these old posts and new claims floating around, it would likely make Yandere Dev fairly paranoid, and explain why he may have felt the need to constantly defend himself because he wanted to stomp out criticism and to quote, debunk the narrative while it was still fairly fresh. He didn't want it becoming the predominant perspective, though as noted by this volunteer, it's probably worth remembering when considering working under him. If 2014 to 2015 was the high, 2016 was the hangover. Yandere Dev did not seem to coherently understand both sides of popularity. He had appeared to have faced these claims back in 2015, but it seems that people didn't really clock how this was affecting development of Yandere Simulator until early 2016. But okay, if his behavior was not how to deal with criticism, how should he deal with it? It's important to remember the source of the impatience, the game itself. 
The fact is that regardless of whether Yandere Dev was a good or bad person, a sensational majority of the fanbase just wanted the game. And there will always be a small minority who will criticize you for other things. Now, when you become successful, you need to adapt to that success. That's something that Yandere Dev clearly couldn't understand because although he had hired volunteers and made a commitment on his Patreon that he'd be hiring volunteers after a certain amount, which he did hit at one point, given his lofty ambitions, he clearly didn't have a grip on balancing the outsourcing and what he wanted to talk about himself. One of the problems here is that Yandere Dev was, and maybe still is, rather possessive over his game. This is probably why he lashed out at people suggesting changes sometimes, or criticizing the choices that he made. It certainly doesn't justify it, but it makes a little more sense. However, being possessive also means wanting to retain creative control to a large extent. You want to see your game developed how you would like it. I understand that, but if you spend so much time working on your own image, of course you're not going to have anywhere near enough time to actually focus on the game and this meant that even if changes were being made, the fact that Yandere Dev was in control meant there was a lack of pace. However, was that about to change? You know, at the right opinion, we are forgiving. I think it's important to let people have the opportunity to grow, as long as you haven't done anything too grim. It's not too late for a redemption arc, and following the Yandere Dev story, at one point you would have thought we might get it. Now, email bollocks aside, the root of the problem that anyone could draw from what we've looked at so far was organization. It's clear that given the output, if it wasn't laziness, which, you know, I'll entertain for the benefit of the doubt's sake, he clearly wasn't handling it well. And at the start of 2017, this seemed to be an issue that he was finally coming to terms with. Let's talk about the speed of Yandere Simulator's development, the obstacles that are slowing down development, and potential solutions that could speed things up. I mean, obviously, it's a complex discussion on principle. We know that Yandere Dev hires volunteers, so he's not necessarily doing this alone. And those volunteers are quite involved within the creation of the game. 90% of the things that you see and hear in Yandere Simulator would never have been possible without the help of those talented people. However, all of these amazing assets come at a cost. I am the game's director, producer, and manager. I am also the lead artist, and the lead animator, modeler, composer, etc. I don't create artwork or animations or models or music, but I am in charge of managing and directing all of the people who produce those things for Yandere Simulator. I am also the game's only programmer. I must perform all of the responsibilities that would normally be performed by about 10 different people if this was a real game company. In spite of this, he is still heavily involved in managing each area. As the director and the manager, he needs to make sure it comes together to make a cohesive vision, something that, on principle, I do empathize with. This is covered extensively in parts one and two of a set of videos that cover the delays of the game, and exactly how he plans on resolving those problems. Wow, we were making progress. So how did he resolve those problems? Let's talk about it. In a pair of videos at the start of 2017 titled What's Taking So Long, he responds to the rhetorical question that many of his audience have asked. However, he doesn't throw any tantrums, he doesn't lose his cool, nor does he try and pin it on emails. He explains the problems of his job and how they and other factors influence how he manages his workload. So in a final, deeper analysis of his problems, he looks at a few solutions. In the past, I placed a strong emphasis on low-hanging fruit. In other words, features that could be implemented within two weeks, with minimal assistance from volunteers. So, for a long time, I was able to add significant new features to the game every two weeks, but eventually I ran out of low-hanging fruit to implement. The next step was to work on the medium-hanging fruit, which required more collaboration with volunteers and more programming work than before. This is when features started to take four weeks or several months to implement. The fruit that I am aiming for now, Osana Najimi, 
is the highest fruit on the tree and requires me to spend extensive amounts of time speaking with volunteers, which leaves me with almost no time to actually write code. Now some may question some of the statements that he makes in this video, particularly pertaining to his workload, and those questions would be completely justified. But whether he was being honest or not, he at least seems to grasp that the current rate of progress is unsustainable. Even though I devote almost every single hour of my life to Yandere Simulator, I've made zero code-related progress on Osana over the past two weeks because of all the other things that take up my time and require my attention. I have no problem managing a team of people, and I enjoy programming, but there simply aren't enough hours in the day to manage a team of people and make significant progress with the game's code. I think that the most elegant solution would be to hire someone to take my place as the game's lead programmer, so that I can focus exclusively on being a director-slash-producer-slash-manager, while someone else writes all the code. I have specialties, but I don't specialize in most of the stuff that Yandere Simulator needs the most. I put forth my best effort, but if a more experienced programmer had been in charge of writing Yandere Simulator's code, they probably would have done a bunch of things way differently. The general tone of this video outlines that he's going to begin making inquiries regarding the outsourcing of various tasks, so he doesn't have to manage everything himself. He's seriously contemplating handing over control in executive areas. That, for many developers, may be a brave move, but it was a necessary move to him, because by keeping the production public and the game accessible, he had a pace that he had to maintain, and if he felt like he couldn't stop, it would not only sacrifice the speed of development, but the quality as well. However, how he would handle over control is another question. Let's discuss the possible methods that he presented. The first one was a crowdfunding campaign. Yandere Dev was planning to do a crowdfunding campaign at some point in the future regardless. This plan merely involved moving the campaign forward and hiring a team to work on the project earlier. Now there are positives to this such as the fact that it allows him to retain control over the greater product. Even if he's assigning roles to other people, this would allow work to be completed faster and maintain hype for the upcoming game while staying in line with his model. Nonetheless, it's also possible that at this point people would feel insulted that he is once again asking for money on top of his Patreon and the amount they've been waiting already would not justify this. The crowdfunding campaign was something he really should have been doing back in 2014. It's also possible that he may not have been able to raise the money at all and that may be quite embarrassing for him as a developer. I could forget about Osana launch the crowdfunding campaign immediately, assemble a team, begin refactoring the game's code as soon as possible, and then release Osana after the refactoring was complete. But I'm not sure if you guys would really want this. The second solution was that he contracts with another company to finish the game. The benefits of this were that he wouldn't have to ask for money from the audience and thus avoids them receiving the impression that he's exploiting them. And he has the stability of a larger business supporting him if he ever feels like he can't hold up the project himself. It's more of a mutual support system. Nonetheless, this came with its own problems, particularly if this was done over contract. Giving up certain creative controls may lead to the sacrifice of one's vision, something that Yandere Dev was notoriously possessive over. It also led to being bound into a contract that under strain may cause the whole project to collapse. Throughout this video, Yandere Dev clearly paints himself as very skeptical towards businesses. I've already been approached by multiple companies who have expressed an interest in getting involved with Yandere Simulator's development in exchange for a cut of the game's profits. They've proposed deals that involve me giving up 50% of the game's profits or losing ownership of the game's intellectual property, or removing certain features from the game. These terms are all very unappealing to me. So it seems that whatever option he wants to choose, there is a degree of reservation regarding them. That was a lot of pressure, but at the end of it all, it was an ultimatum. If Yandere Dev continued to try and do the project alone, the time it would take for the video game to be released anyway would kill the hype regardless. So he stated that he was prepared to take the plunge. There was one more option that he presented, but I'm gonna save that for later. 
The Andre Dev conducted a poll with these options, and the fandom decisively backed him to remain on the current trajectory. But the problem was, although preferable to many, maybe even to Yandere Dev himself, it wasn't sustainable. Yandere had continuously committed to wanting the game released by 2019, and there was no scope of that happening if he continued in the current direction. However, was this all smoke and mirrors, or was he going to follow through on a commitment for once? Well, not too long after, he posted a video which announced that Yandere Simulator was about to enter a collaboration phase. Alongside this, the criticism of the companies in the previous video had been reeled in a little. During this part of the video, I portrayed companies as evil, greedy entities that would steal money from me, take full possession of Yandere Simulator, and censor the game. It was a bad idea to portray companies like this, because not every game developer or game publisher is like that. The language that I used to describe companies in my previous video probably had a strong effect on the poll where I asked people what they wanted me to do. Let me take a moment to talk about companies in a non-biased way. Over the past two weeks, I've spent a lot of time speaking with a company that has experience developing games, publishing games, and also working together with struggling developers to help them finish their games. This company has a very good reputation among indie devs, and their name came up numerous times when I asked other developers to recommend a good company to work with. When I asked people for their opinion on this company, Nobody was able to tell me a single negative thing about them. Yandere Dev had made the decision to go towards a publisher or developer rather than a crowdfunding project. Who though? Well, a publishing company named TinyBuild. TinyBuild are an independent games company based in Washington. The state, not the city. Well, there are multiple cities named Washington, but you know what I mean. They're the developers of the game, no time to explain. However, they've also published games from all over the globe, and you've probably heard of some of them. Tiny Build was probably one of the better options. They have experience and credit within the industry. However, they're not too corporate, and that might lend to some more trust between the collaborators in question. Yandere Dev himself was very optimistic, stating that he'd never heard about any bad experiences with the company, and that many had recommended them to him. His partnership with Tiny Build would assure many new developers coming onto the game and working under his management. He would still be the lead designer, he would still have the final say, there was no power being taken away from him. The only catch was that there would be no content that may provide it with an adults only rating, but that was something that he had anticipated regardless. Overall, the plan was for Tiny Build to take over many of the more business related matters on top of the development aspects that Yandere Dev felt like he was weaker in. I have no experience hiring people, drafting contracts, trademarking things, or any of the other business related or law related aspects of game development. I'm good at making prototypes and implementing low-hanging fruit very quickly, but I'm not really experienced enough to write complex character AI or do some of the other complicated things that are needed to make Yandere Simulator become a reality. So it makes perfect sense for me to partner up with a company like TinyBuild and let them handle all of the things that I'm bad at while I focus only on the things that I'm good at. Yandere Dev also clarifies that this partnership mostly covers creative resources, rather than monetary funding. Thus, although crowdfunding may still be a possibility, he would eventually charge people to play the alpha version of the game, once he considers it complete enough to begin charging. This is a decision that he would make after he had finished Osana. He also said he would not be changing much monetarily, and YouTube ad revenue alongside Patreon were still his only sources of income. However, one of the most significant developments was that Tiny Build would be providing Yandere Dev with a programmer who would sort out a new code for the game while he was working on Osana. Progress would be slow at first, but eventually, as according to this very professional graph, the pace would pick up as Tiny Build take over more assets, leaving Yandere Dev to focus on his executive role. Wow. Like a jigsaw, it was all finally falling into place. Except it didn't. It kind of failed. Well, yeah, but we're meant to build up the tension. Yes, I'm sure your viewers are on the edge of their seat waiting for me to pop up, aren't they? What we're supposed to do is talk about coding. Do you know about programming? I'm a gamer first and foremost, and I always will be. Huh. I don't see you as the gaming type. Okay, then let's talk about the failure of the tiny build partnership, shall we? 
A game development cycle is the most turbulent time of the year. There's a saying when it comes to game development, if all else fails, hire someone to do the job for you and then reap all the benefits for being a sole developer while leaving the poor person in the dust to become a ghost in the industry. I made that one up. But the point is that it's extremely rare for someone to work on a massive game completely and utterly on their own with no assistance whatsoever. And when someone does and releases it to a wide audience, there's a chance that it could turn out really, really good or really, really bad. I've talked about this in my own video, but for the uninitiated, Yandere Simulator is a game that runs on the Unity engine. Before you get your super powered panties in a twist, I'm not slating the Unity engine itself. Games that are made on the Unity engine, like any other engine, all have varying degrees of quality. You only noticed the bad asset flips because the developers didn't have enough money to remove the watermark at the beginning of the game and have to hang their heads in shame as the dreaded grey screen shows up saying that yes, this game is indeed made on the Unity engine. Going back to Yandere Simulator and the most common complaint about the game was that it runs like an athlete in co but he's got a third leg protruding from his stomach and he runs by constantly front flipping down the track and the buttons also included the mouse keys on the side. The game was horrible to run even on a beast rig. Loading up into the lobby and you're greeted with less frames than viewers on the standard mixer stream and all you could really do to keep your PC from bricking itself was look at the floor. Of course this spells problems for the casual player with a less than stellar PC and significant lack of YouTube money, as opening the game would open your entire town to nuclear destruction. There are quite a few reasons why this is an issue, especially in Yandere Simulator, but the biggest one goes down to the way the game's being programmed by the dev. If you looked at the game without any knowledge as to its background or how it was even created, you'd probably think that it could easily run on a calculator, but if you played it, you'd probably be lucky to get a frame in. But why is this? I touched upon this in my own video, but if there was one thing Yandere dev wasn't really the best at, it was programming his game properly to work efficiently and on all devices. The code looked like a complete nightmare. It was like the whole concept of variables was unheard of to him. Before you guys brandish your pitchforks and call for my public execution for being mean about his coding when he never had any experience before, let me explain why a lot of people take a big issue with this programming. Yandere Simulator has been in active development for about five to six years, and he's been programming the game the entire time when he wasn't live streaming video games or making more videos explaining the lore. He's being paid the same wage if not more than professional programmers who by now would have completely finished the game and done several patches to it and released it on the Nintendo Switch and Nokia Brick. He's commented that he knows his code looks awful and that he only codes on areas that aren't used frequently. If he's saying that, then that means he clearly knows how to code properly, so why isn't he doing it? The code looks like a complete mess! In the code, he uses the update function and he fills it to the brim with things that the game will do at that specific point. The problem is that with this function, said things would run every single frame. I can go into more detail about the coding, but several programmers have made comments and points about it, so I'll leave notes about about what the professionals say were trolls, so he can add it to the really, really large amount of sources that's been compiled for the video. Now, where does Tiny Build come in? Tiny Build offered to extend their services to Yandere Dev as any professional programmer would look at the code that he's done and projectile vomit all over the screen. Initially reluctant to have another programmer do a better job than him, he eventually caved and a developer was sent to work on the game, with Tiny Build hopping on board to publish the game should it get released. Good coding is meant to be flexible, quick and efficient, so that when needed, you can make quick optimizations edits and make sure the game doesn't murder your Intel Atom processor from 1923. This is what the tiny build developer ended up getting up to, optimizing hundreds of lines of code to make sure that the game runs slightly better than it did before that point, which meant removing the depressing amounts of else if arguments in the code. The partnership lasted a while with the programmer allegedly redoing most of the code of the game, until he was suddenly dropped with a statement made on Yandere Dev's Patreon, pretty much saying that the code couldn't be read because it was too simplified and there was a lack of else if statements to boot, as it would hint the progress of him making his game. At this, Tiny Build packed their bags and left the project, probably not seeing a completion date for the game this decade or even century. With their departure and the programmers yeeting off the project, Yandere Dev was now free to execute an extra 2048 lines of code in a single update function to run every single frame, and finish his plan to cause global warming all over again and raise the overall heat of the earth with the amount of fried PCs the game would end up causing over the next few years. But this wasn't the only thing that Yandere Dev had been accused of neglecting, nay, he had more trouble under his belt that even more information has been shown as recent as a week before writing the segment, and that heinous crime is... Stealing assets. 
Allegedly, it's been stated that he's been stealing assets for his game, and while I wouldn't put it past him to do such a thing, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt in this situation. Throughout the entirety of the development cycle of the game thus far, Yandere Dev has promised that the models and assets that are currently in the game will be replaced down the line with more polished models from the ground up. The very model for the main character of the game is taken straight out of the Unity Asset Store, and quite a lot of the assets around the school were taken from various places from the internet. Now, standard development practices list that without a license or specific written permission from the owner of the assets as well as credit, you cannot monetize your game whatsoever. You just got caught using that one font that you downloaded from the font years ago on a used park bench asset that you forgot even existed? Well too bad, someone found it and now you're thousands of dollars in debt and your game's been banned from every single marketplace ever conceivable. Now Yandere Dev didn't want any of this to happen to his game. He was planning on making big bucks and selling it on the biggest marketplaces known to man and the Epic Ooh. Game Store. So he promised that the models of the game would change down the line. Now you guys must have heard from either me or Tro earlier on that Yandere Dev makes use of volunteers to keep the game going on. He isn't a one man band, a man needs help! And what better way to get help than with people who are sacrificing their free time in order to provide you with some assets to improve your game? Which is exactly what one artist did for him. On Twitter, an artist named Sozo Maika recently made a thread unearthing the turbulent tales of her encounters with the dev. She had improved the character designs of the game to make them 50 times more original than the original content. Concept, providing concept art for Yandere Chan amongst other things. She states that she was asked to modify the in-game model, design posters, illustrate his YouTube skits, redraw another artist's work because he didn't like the quality, design skins and contribute some props. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, that's a whole lot of work, surely she didn't do all of it. Well, she ended up doing the entire thing and submitted it. Now before you get your pitchforks out again and blast the artist for working for free, you guys need to understand that at the time she was still a teenager and worked on multiple jobs in addition to trying to build her online presence and portfolio. And besides, it was the perfect opportunity to work with the Yandere Dev just as long as she got credit. The video was released and to the shock and horror of a grand total of no one, there was no credit in the video. She had to email Yandere Dev to get credit for the work she did and when she asked, he told her, citing nepotism as a reason. In this thread, Maika also shows the emails that Yandere Dev sent her and I'll just present these without comment. Discounting the melodramatic nature of some of these emails, why does there need to be a back and forth about this? Just Credit the artist? Other games don't seem to have this issue, so I don't understand what the problem is here. Especially if the artist didn't ask for payment or anything, just credit. The work that was handed to her was very intense and that's enough work for a full-time freelancer gig. So the fact that she didn't ask for money in the first place makes it even more essential that you give her full credit for the work she did immediately on publication. All in all, the rampant mismanagement of the game seems to never end and hopefully there's going to be some improvements to the way the game is run? Yeah, I'm not too sure about that one. But at least this was a fun revisit to the antics of Yandere Dev. Back to you in the studio. If I hire an experienced veteran programmer with experience in the Unity game engine to take my place on Yandere Simulator, he's not going to want to work with my code and pick up from where I left off. He's going to want to rebuild many of the game's most important systems so that the game has a proper foundation. That's going to be a massive yikes from me. Yandere Dev was never particularly well trained in the area of development. Although he described himself as strong at implementing the quote low hanging fruit, this was probably simply because it was something he was capable of doing using a less than ideal method. In some future posts, he said that he couldn't talk about the deterioration of his partnership with Tiny Build, although he later said something, so I'm not sure what the terms of his legal contract were. In summary, it appears that Yandere Dev had compatibility issues with a more efficient system, and I think that can be a problem. He would often go on in the future to frame it as a subjective difference, despite admitting to being poor at it in previous videos, and I don't think it's merely creative differences. So let me explain. Okay, so, I play squash. It's a fun game. For most squash players who want to win matches, there are a general set of principles that your style of play should adhere to. We all have personal touches that help us develop our own brand, but at the end of the day, if you play in a style that is too incompatible with the game of squash, chances are you won't win the game. This is a general principle that you can follow into most professions and hobbies. Creating a video game stems from the same general rules. It is likely that we have our own personal flair and approach, but there are general rules that will alter the outcome 
not come in a possibly favorable and unfavorable way with your audience. At the end of the day, the only person I'm playing a squash game for is me. There is no one else out there who is invested in my performance, so I'm not expected to perform. However, if I was contracted or if I was playing for a league team, I think it'd be reasonable for me to adhere to a few rules to make sure that my performance in the task was somewhat efficient. Now, Yandere Dev could develop a game how he wanted to on principle. However, he also had a lot of people who had an implanted expectation based on industry standards. And given that he was often appealing to that audience for the funding and support, you'd think he would have been more focused on delivering. When his initiative received a groundswell of support in 2014, what he should have done is worked out how to improve his skill at programming before then working out how to develop the game in a constructive way rather than basing his developments off what would build the most hype and just doing it his own way which only postponed the eventual confrontation of the unfinished game. When a solution had finally been calculated, almost three years after the development began, his previous approach to creating the game made working with what he had incredibly difficult, and his prevailing stubbornness when presented with a possible solution eventually prevented the progress that may have been achieved. It reminds me of an old post he made where he turned some harsh coding feedback he received from his idol into a Batman's origin story. I turned the hatred into a burning passion. It's a daft post and he did actually admit he was wrong in 2015 so i'm not going to hold it against him but i don't think he thought about the feedback enough because we ended up in this mess regardless it's hard to fully empathize with him because to me it seems he must have apprehended these problems in advance and pushed on regardless instead by going for the quote low hanging fruit it meant that the problems with his style didn't become apparent until after a significant amount of development had taken place because he was so focused on that and it pushed to a point where it was much hard to reverse, to the point where Tiny Build couldn't continue. Yandere Dev himself was too stubborn to learn how to adapt, and the progress of the game suffered for it. However, living in this world of denial, come 2018, he decided that actually all these factors that are basically self-evidential at this point were not to blame, and he had his own theory. In another condescending video, I don't know how he does it with that tone, called How Long Does It Take To Make A Video Game, he presents his own version of events. How long does it take to make a video game? The answer is, it depends on a large number of different factors, such as the genre, the budget, the size of the team, the complexity of the game, whether it's an original game or an imitation and a bunch of other factors that you probably wouldn't have considered. It's not an exact science. You can't really create a formula that tells you exactly how long a game should be in development for, because each game has a different set of circumstances. Let's break down the main points of the video then. The first one is that the length that a video game takes to be developed typically corresponds to the quality. He once again used a very compelling graph to demonstrate this. And although obviously it's quite easy to pick out the low sample number he uses and the fact that obviously it would not be difficult to cherry pick this at all, as a point it's much easier to focus on the implication that somehow this as a universal rule can be applied to his game, even though he specifically opened with the statement that there were no specific formulas for the completion of a game. So we've established that the more complex a game is, the longer it's going to take to develop it. Small teams usually stick to simple games. When a small team tries to make a large, ambitious game, the development can really stretch out for a long time. Do you see where I'm going with this? After asserting that games that are longer in the making are typically higher in their complexity, particularly when they are comprised of small development teams, he goes on to say that the complexity of his game, Yandere Simulator, is comparable to a Hitman game combined with a Persona game. He then goes on to expand on all the complexities of this game, and I'm not particularly sold. First, as the complexity of a project increases, it will become proportionally difficult to work on it. Every time you add a new feature, it will affect other features, create new bugs, increase the amount of time you need to spend waiting for the code to compile, increase the loading times of the game, etc. Something that was simple and easy to work on at the beginning can eventually become a nightmare that you are constantly wrestling with, where making even the smallest amount of progress becomes very time-consuming and difficult. It's hard to deny that Yandere Simulator 
is an ambitious game in many ways. However, I certainly wouldn't say it's almost as complex as two renowned games combined, particularly when a lot of the actual results are not there. In 2017, Yandere Dez said that the simplicity or complexity of the game would be based on the amount of support it received, implying that he was willing to compromise on certain elements. The scope of Yandere Simulator will be determined by the size of its budget. The more money we raise, the more time, work, and features we can put into the game. But in this video, he clearly implies that it will be complex regardless of the outcome and uses it as a shield for the length it has taken to develop the game. Once again, it's a sacrifice of realistic goals for personal sentiments and the condescending explanation of why everyone should deal with it. On top of the programming argument that Thaf9 is likely debunked in his part, Yandere Dev eventually talks about mental health, a very serious matter. If you push yourself to work as many hours as humanly possible every single day, then eventually, you're going to burn yourself out. You'll become too exhausted and fatigued to be productive. If you work on the same project for multiple years, you'll eventually get tired of it. This will lead to a loss of enthusiasm and motivation, which will cause you to become more easily distracted and less productive. If a group of weird people on the internet decide that they feel completely justified in treating you like garbage, and you're subjected to abusive treatment on a daily basis for multiple years, you'll become depressed, which will affect your productivity, which will cause people to call you lazy or a scam artist, which will cause you to receive even more abuse, which will cause you to become even more depressed and less productive, which becomes a never-ending cycle of abuse and depression. Your fan base won't know about this for a long time because you'll do your best to never speak of it. Eventually, your comment sections will be dominated by people who want to hurl insults at you and spew ridiculous misinformation that isn't anywhere close to being true. Maybe a handful of people will behave with dignity and respect, but an overwhelming number of people will be cruel and abusive. I have to break this down because mental health in many ways is a subject close to my heart, but at the same time, there are a lot of layers to this. Firstly, let's talk about motivation. We have good days and bad days. I empathize there, but you also have to understand that if people feel that you are not keeping up with these things, particularly if they're supporting you monetarily, they're going to become impatient. And the problem with Yandere Dev is that he never explained himself in a way that was empathetic to people's concerns. That was his failing all the way back in 2016, and he hadn't amended people's concerns by this point either. How about the unjustified harassment that he had been receiving and how that demotivates him? Now, I would agree to an extent that honestly, there are people out there who are too obsessed with Yandere Dev and he is quite the target. Nonetheless, as said, to imply it's those experiences that make you demotivated while not being able to take a step back from the internet and seeing the bigger picture is a weakness that has to be partly accountable to you. Asking where these obsessive individuals came from as if you think they just randomly threw a dart and landed on you is dishonest. I feel that a lot of these sentiments built from 2016, 2015, where they were jumped on by bad actors after a point is another discussion. He acknowledges that this is a small minority who are going after him and he says that a lot of the people he has interactions with are positive, but never really defines those people from the harsher critics. I'd say it's probable that there were some people looking to stir stuff up, but it's only because sharks smell blood. And when some of Yandere Dev's behavior and responses started coming to light, they saw a guy who they could bait into lashing out and decimating his own image even further. And Yandere Dev just could never understand that. That's the other issue I take with this, his framing. He acts like he's avoided the drama and negative comments and acts like it's all flared up out of nowhere. He says he hasn't talked about it, but that's just a lie. There have been times when he's been too far involved and the only reason more fans probably didn't know is because he does suppress a fair bit of it. And this led me to a new point, that I think social media harmed Yandere Dev and the simulator more than anything. Let's talk about it. YouTube is not the most fun environment a lot of the time. The feedback from people can be pretty negative, pretty depressing, and I completely empathize with how that might affect productivity. But as a game developer, if you're prone to responding badly to negative criticism, maybe a YouTube channel and multiple social media accounts wasn't the best idea. 
That doesn't justify any harassment. And I want to make that 100% clear. But from a personal perspective, it's clear that Yandere Dev cannot help himself but try and respond, whether that criticism was valid or not. And when he can't respond to it, he'll just try and censor it. The video that we just covered, in spite of its rather significant view count, only has approximately 740 comments, with a distinct lack of critical comments, even polite ones. And you're going to have a hard job convincing me that no one posted anything remotely nuanced. At one point, it had 72 comments off over 800,000 views. Another place where censorship has been documented was the Reddit for Yandere Simulator, where many had also been critical of it. At the end of 2018, it was alleged that he had bought it, although the exact words in the Discord post were, in exchange for compensation. In the past, Yandere Dev had attempted to quash the claims against him by making a post on the subreddit, admitting he had attempted to buy it, but clearly this was not enough, with many people rebutting him at that point, alongside one now censored comment comprehensively responding and sharing some evidence of their own which shows Yandere Dev in a less than positive light, while proudly stating that they were pleased that the subreddit wasn't bought. However, this did not last. In the end, he purchased it. What was the price? $3,000 for a subreddit. <laughs> Let that sink in. He had attempted to make his own subreddit too, but it seems that this was not enough due to the volume of people on the other one. Yandere Dev had made it no secret that he was not particularly fond of the Reddit community. In fact, he often doesn't seem particularly fond of many communities, but his post announcing his acquisition was quite dark telling a story of a person who had manipulated administrations of the subreddit into believing that Yandere Dev was an evil person, and then the harassment just spread like a disease, and it all became too much for him as a person. He writes, what other game developers had to deal with this? It's become anxiety-inducing to even look at the subreddit. Can you name any other game developer who has had to deal with this nonsense? All these other subreddits are just so lovely. And they don't have any issues. Why does Yandere Dev just receive this unprovoked backlash? Looking at the archives, it's clear there was a lot of drama on his subreddit. And if you want to keep your subreddit away from drama, I'd understand. In August, I found posts about how they were going to decrease discussion of Yandere Dev and create a new dedicated Reddit for him. Sounds peachy. However, it seems that a large majority of what Yandere Dev is alleging happened earlier on in the year. And the most popular critical posts, although quite scathing, weren't really harassing. Although it's hard to tell exactly, as a large majority of them have been deleted. However, I did manage to dig up some of the censored posts, mostly following his How Long video. And a lot of them are pretty concise and some are just plain responses. Nonetheless, one trend I did notice was the promotion of a Patreon boycott following that video. And in that month, it seems that Yandere Dev lost over $1,000 in Patreon money, which probably bothered him a lot. There was also a Karma Court case, which is like this court in Reddit. I don't think they have any legal jurisdiction, but it's a thing and I'm not going to pretend to understand it. You guys do you. To summarize, there was some BS happening. To what extent, I'm not sure. His comments weren't the most encouraging. He wasn't really interested in whether the criticism was well structured or whether it was harassing, regardless of how he frames it. Yes, at the end of the post, he states that any public criticism of him can only be done in bad faith as it means you're trying to stir up drama. And if you have any other criticism of him, you should email him. Now, if you want your subreddit to not be about criticism against you, you're the boss. It's a subreddit, not a democracy. And that's what I always say about these things. But with the context of the criticism that he'd been receiving, to many people, this justification once again did not seem concerned about harassment, but more about a desire to control the narrative, rather than focusing on the damn game. I have a hunch that Yandere Dev felt that a lot of the criticism were mostly people pretending to care, and that it was a slippery slope to some of the harassment that he claimed to have been receiving. But for many, that theory just wouldn't cut it. The reason why public criticism exists, even on a personal level, is because Yandere Dev is a person asking for money and support on the basis of trust in his character that he will deliver a game. And if people feel that game isn't going to be delivered and that people's money would be better invested elsewhere, then they 100% have a right to say that publicly because that is in the interest of every single person who has invested time or money into your project. 
Now, once again, although presenting himself as a very busy person, Yandere Dev managed to find time to moderate this subreddit. Many of the critical posts disappeared, and in spite of Yandere Dev's claims, he was very involved in the control of what appeared on his Reddit. Because managing a subreddit is definitely what a person under time constraints to create a video game should be doing. Yandere Dev was very blessed to receive the feedback on his game back in 2014, and I can understand that when faced with this support, he decided to try and use social media media to maintain momentum. However, he should have restricted his interactions maximum to YouTube uploads for what he was trying to do. Maybe if he was a bit better at responding to criticism consistently, then he would have been able to engage on other mediums. But there's a reason a large majority of game developers, even indie game developers, do not rely on public sentiment as buoyancy for a game alone. However, I have a feeling that Yandere Dev was aware because as we saw with Tiny Build, he would have trouble without that public support. The fact is that in spite of Yandere's narrative of personal persecution, a majority of YouTube's audiences are a lot less pedantic than industry experts, funnily enough. And that fact was why a lot of the criticism didn't appear until much later when people started looking at it with a more critical eye. If he'd have taken his concept to a larger developer or industry player early on, then he probably would have received some sharp technical criticism that could have averted these issues later on, if he had listened to them, of course. And in all fairness, in spite of the volume of criticism that he has been subjected to, his videos are still relatively popular. People are still engaging with his content, and the one thing that he hasn't censored, the like to dislike bar, is regularly heavily in his favor. It seemed like his tactics had worked in a way, although I feel this would have been less of a big deal if he just hadn't engaged it at all. He was certainly able to prevent the narrative spreading to the core of his support base. I make that statement with a level of reservation because his Patreon, which is probably a barometer of those closest to the game, shows a bit of lost faith, with its current amount being less than 50% than its peak. It seems that there are a lot more viewers who perhaps find more entertainment value in just watching the videos rather than directly monetarily supporting development of the game. Although Patreon isn't his only method of income and he does stream and collect YouTube ad rev, which would be a very impressive amount if all his videos are monetized, although they probably aren't. So we can attack this lady. Oh my god! Jesus f Christ! In many ways, Yandere Dev managed to shelter a lot of people from the criticism that he had received, and if not, he managed to hold them to one side of the narrative. However, the roots of the problem seem clear to me. In light of these shortcomings of the development of Yandere Simulator, people began to become restless, and that restlessness has manifested into certain behaviors, some of which are rational, and some of which are irrational. But Yandere Dev's response was often less than rational. Let's begin to wrap this up. This video has gone into a lot of detail about the failings of Yandere Dev. Now I've laid it out, I hope it's clear to see why certain decisions led him to this ultimatum. It's a classic snowball situation, one where neither the creator nor his critics, and sometimes more obsessive followers, were prepared to yield, so it escalated. And when these situations transpire, one of the inevitabilities is that commentators are going to pick up on it. Now, going back to the start of 2018, this was definitely part of the attention that really bothered Yandere Dev. The video that was the harshest was the rise and fall of Yandere Dev, a two-hour saga that spent a decent amount of time going through a lot of his worst old posts in crippling detail. It probably did upset Yandere Dev given how he'd hope it was behind him, and he probably felt he had responded. And he had to a degree. He wrote a lot of posts on his Tumblr, attempting to, quote, clear up misunderstandings. I think some of his posts do clear up certain issues, but there are also two problems with these responses. Firstly, the structure. It would often involve him quoting without any context. This could allow him to create straw man arguments at will. And obviously reading it, many would argue that he did. The responses were quite general and thus never gave a sense of closure to a lot of specific situations that occurred. Secondly, the responses weren't easy to find. They were on his Tumblr, but they were spread out and hard to follow. If you wanted something specific, good luck. By doing this, it gave me the impression that he was typically just appealing to the fans that he already had, who would hear what other people are saying through Yandere Dev as well, rather than going directly to those sources. And on top of other comments, such as the ones made on his Reddit post, I think he often viewed public critics as beyond conversion. 
Fair enough, but pushing away your critics requires your audience to have some faith in you. And as said, although he has an audience, financial support has taken a hit through organized boycotts and other creators spreading publicity. His responses often hit the weak point of being too vague to provide himself reasonable defense, but existent enough to draw more attention to them. Other commentators jumping on this didn't help his plight, often looking with a critical eye towards his rash nature. I've also tried not to harp on the content of these old posts too much, but it doesn't help that many of them are pretty unnerving. Even though, as I acknowledged, they were done a long time ago, at that point, his sporadic and even dismissive responses would obviously sour many people. Now, I wanted to spend this final or nearly final part, please, God, let me finish, talking about this. Because towards the end of 2018, Yandere Dev continued to reflect on the criticism and hate that he had been receiving and decided to make an over 20 minute video addressing it called Hate and Shame. Not the most valuable usage of one's time, but I digress. The video is an interesting one. Imagine that someone decides to take all of these embarrassing moments from your past, put them into a list and show that list to his friends. Then he claims that this list represents you. His friends believe him and develop a twisted mental image of you. They perceive you as a caricature of who you really are, with all of your flaws greatly exaggerated. Unfortunately for you, their hobby is ridiculing and shaming people, and they've decided that you would be a fun target. And so they start stalking you. They follow you everywhere you go, taking pictures of you, recording videos of you, and digging through your trash to look for anything embarrassing you might have thrown away. Sometimes they even try to directly provoke you, because they think it's funny if they get a reaction out of you. If you're an artist, they'll claim that you're bad at painting. If you're a chef, they'll claim that you're bad at cooking. And if you're a programmer, they'll claim that you're bad at writing code. I assume this is meant to be an analogy, although it's hard to tell. The hate and shame video is basically 22 minutes of Yandere Dev talking from this disconnected perspective about his own personal experience. His purpose clear is to try and make people empathize with him and maybe give him some advice. I was going to say that his video shows a failure to distinguish between the online and real world, but then he goes to talk about the real world harassment that he alleges to have received. After enough people have been convinced that you're an awful, terrible person who deserves to be ridiculed and scorned, you will begin to receive harassment. Prank calls, weird things being mailed to your house, getting spammed with pictures of animal abuse and bestiality, being stalked in real life. The video made me feel two things, sad and manipulated. It's a depressing video, and this could be how Yandere Dev interprets the situation. He has this status that would obviously not make elements of the internet enjoyable. And there is a lot of personal stuff out there, but I also find it very manipulative, the use of generalizations, vagueness, and purely anecdotal content. It personally rubs me the wrong way. And I get that the internet can be a pretty toxic place. It sucks that there are always people out there a little too obsessed with you. And with something like Yandere Simulator and the sort of cult-like state it acquired, it's very easy for one of those avid fans to become sour and then be on an all-out crusade to get you, probably bolstered by some real sycophants on the more menacing sides of the internet, and that will probably spill into your real life. So I'm not saying for certain that this didn't happen, but my god, you don't feed the trolls. Yandere Dev was practically providing them with an all-you-can-eat buffet. In a later post, he stated that his video on emails actually led to an increase in emails. So I don't know why he thought a video on this topic would lead to any sort of de-escalation. These videos also had a tendency to spray fire at their targets. Although in a later post, Yandere Dev would claim that his video was mostly directed towards these trolls and harassers. In the video, he draws a clear link between the people who have criticized him as those who are also responsible for the harassment, implying that they are the people who then go out and do that harassment. Although, as mentioned, it's likely these were quite different parties due to the altering motivations and goals that would come with it. On top of this, parts of his video seem to encompass points even more general, attacking YouTubers who have spoken about him, using video titles to reference creators like Kappa Kaiju and Thaf9, while calling out their approach to making their videos. Channels that are dedicated to ridiculing and shaming other people. These YouTubers make money by degrading, debasing, and defaming others. Eventually, these YouTubers will hear what the gremlins are saying about you, and then they will start making videos about you. It doesn't benefit them to portray you with accuracy and honesty. 
it benefits them to exaggerate your flaws and depict you as a cartoonish caricature of who you really are, because that would be more entertaining and will result in more clicks and views, maximizing their ad revenue. If they really were interested in telling the truth, then they would contact you directly and ask you for your side of the story. However, none of them will ever do this. I think ultimately the problem with this video and the problem with all of this drama is that he skips a key part of responding to drama. And it's ultimately why he ended up in this mess. And that is evidence. I know people like Kabukaiju and Thaf9. They may not be gods or gurus. They may not be the all-seeing eye. I'm not either. But they don't go out with the intention of crucifying people. They go with what they're given. And at that point, they had very little from Yandere Dev. You can't just say, oh, if they really want something, they should email me. If you're not prepared to put something out there publicly, why should they trust you in private with it? I've trusted people in private before, and it has cost me. If you don't have anything publicly revolutionary to say to the drama, don't say anything at all. Yandere Dev always wanted to talk about it, but never had anything to actually say. And fortunately, his audience recognized that because at the end of his hate and shame video, he conducted a poll asking whether he should make more videos regarding this issue, oh God, or whether he should leave it behind and focus on the game. People voted pretty conclusively for the latter, the game. I think that's something of importance to note regarding this video. It is once more an appeal to his already existent audience on what he should do about this drama. If you don't like Yandere Dev, you're not going to like this video. And boy, a fair few people did not. There were a load more criticisms about him deleting comments, including this video, which shows them being removed in live time. Once again, even mild ones. There was a person who claimed to be the original artist for the video who had their own comments to make about the dev's behavior. Ironically, yet unsurprisingly, this video about drama caused more drama. I'm not going to rule out the idea that Yandere Dev may have experienced some legitimate harassment at the hands of trolls, and he has regularly cited this as the reason for why he has behaved in a rather erratic and even toxic way himself. Nonetheless, I feel that this can only be used as a defense up to a point, because his short-tempered demeanor was existent prior to the escalation of the drama that he argued to be engaged in, and his behavior has extended beyond the erratic and emotional into the calculated. It just reaches a point where where you line all the drama up and it becomes hard to say that these incidents are as isolated as he claims them to be. I don't doubt that Yandere Dev probably had many positive interactions with his audience, and I'm not going to argue against that point. But even in context with Yandere Dev's greater character, the negative interactions held a significant frequency and relevance to the discussion at hand. A lot of the video was once again focusing on what he was experiencing rather than a natural response to the points against him. And maybe we would have received a more concise response if people had voted for it. But I don't know how he would respond to the various criticisms that escalated throughout the year, such as the volunteers who claimed he wasn't treating them well enough, the Discord users who claimed he just spontaneously banned them for no discernible reason, the people he flipped out at over email or whatever other communicative mediums. Since then, he has reiterated the idea that the harassment was what caused him to behave in such a way. If he believes the harassment placed him in a negative state of mind that predisposed him, to behave in such a way, then what else would he have had to say in additional videos? I think for the benefit of him, his audience, and for anyone involved, it was best left there. So what has happened since then? Well, the only real point of interest in this is what is known as the debunk page, which provides running updates to criticism that he's been receiving. It's certainly more nuanced than his previous responses, and one thing I did appreciate was that he seems to recognize those who are frustrated with the game's development in a nuanced way, though I'm not sure how he treats that attitude publicly. And I do feel that such an approach is prone to miscategorization, and I'd stress that it's always best to side on the benefit of the doubt when dealing with certain criticisms. As you, the viewer, you are more than at liberty to check out these responses as they're probably the most composed Yandere Dev has been. Although I would stress that many have taken issue with them still and made videos of their own. I find the response page rather defensive and although definitely a bit more refreshing, it's not a significant deviation from its old narratives that I would still personally take issue with. 
The point is, when dealing with drama, if you don't have anything that's going to turn perspective on its head, particularly when your content is being well received otherwise, it's not sensible to make videos obsessing over the situation. In a Discord post, he said that everything after this was going to worsen. First a 20% dislike bar, then a 30% dislike bar, then 50%, 100%, 1000%. Everything was going to fall apart and the game would be cancelled and no one would support him anymore. But wait, it didn't. Why not? Let's end this. Yandere Dev acted like he was on the verge of losing everything, yet even at its lowest, his videos were backed up by a strong, dedicated audience. There are only two ways that losing momentum of his size could happen. Firstly, if someone makes a well-written, devastating, exposed video or post and completely turn public perception on its head, or if people in general become disillusioned or bored as a whole and stop supporting. The first one didn't really happen, the only well-organized videos were fairly mild-mannered and others were just not well-produced enough. So maybe it's the second, but that didn't really happen either. There were disillusioned people, but not that many of them, and even fewer who were actually taking part in any of the stuff that he accused people of. People who want to spread criticism of your game or hurt your image probably aren't going to be the same as people who want to harass you because that would compromise their own point. Providing that happened, that was likely mostly trolls who latched onto the dissolution as an excuse to cause havoc. A lot of attention on the drama was generated by Yandere Dev himself, and although the minority was quite vocal at points, its reach was limited to certain domains, only being boosted when Yandere Dev would respond himself. Let's be clear, the people who said shut up and focus on the game were doing Yandere Dev a massive service, and he should have listened sooner. For a bit, it did tail off, but it flared up again at the start of 2020, with what seemed to be more completely unnecessary drama. Yandere Dev placed his Discord server in a position where you pay to message due to an alleged number of raids. And although it's his server, once again, it seems like a bad thing to be managing himself. Someone tweeted out an interaction where they messaged him suggesting technical changes that could prevent raids while also maintaining activity, which of course there are multiple. You turn off link embeds, turn off images, slow mode, strong moderation team, IP banning, blacklisted words, and I hate this discussion because eventually when this guy clearly presents a load of solutions and rebuts Yandere Dev's comments, Yandere Dev just turns around and says, actually, you don't get it. No, my friend, you don't get it. And I wonder if you'll ever get it. If there are technical solutions to a problem, you can't appeal to some greater level of understanding which doesn't exist. Some people might get past one or two blocks, but Discord has a load of settings and bots that can be used to prevent such activity without using a paywall, which is what it is. No semantics. He did open up again, thankfully, but Jesus Christ, this drama has turned the Discord into a bit of a punchline, with people speed running it. People see this stuff as funny, Yandere Dev doesn't, takes it very seriously, and then people meme it more. It's a cycle. In now deleted tweet made in January 2020, Yandere Dev also alludes to taking his own life due to this harassment. And without sounding like Tyler the Creator, and with all respect to the fact that online work can be extremely stressful, he needs to take a step back from the internet and stop engaging in it to the degree he does. Add this to the claim that he's making less than minimum wage right now, which, although I personally find to be doubtful given his revenue stream, if true, I have to wonder what his motivations even are for continuing at this stage. There are so many posts of him involving himself with drama, DMing people, long messages, interviews, some petty arguments. I don't know if he thinks he needs to have this interaction to maintain interest in the game. Maybe he's won people over in the DMs, he probably has. But so many times, it just gets published and shows him as someone with an inability to communicate with basic criticism in spite of him proclaiming his proficiency. It's like Yandere Dev has this almost parasitic relationship with the internet. He sees it as the only way of maintaining the development of his game, and yet he has so much drama and conflict, he thinks he's attaching himself out of necessity rather than desire, and this leads to completely destructive behavior which he feels he has to suffer through, but by proxy of that, makes him a victim. On the other hand, Yandere Dev's critics view this victimhood as being exploited at every opportunity in an attempt to blanket harassment with legitimate criticism and Yandere Dev's continuous 
continuous failure to deliver a finished product which for many should have been delivered a long time ago. If you're a fan, then you may well sympathize with him, but few would disagree that a lot of this has been avoidable. And people have still been contacting me about it. I wonder if it's because people want my verdict on the actual progress of the game. It's hard to say. Yandere Dev now posts update reports, but they don't show anything too radical. People are still waiting on the character Osana. He seems more focused on other developments before moving on to that. And it's obvious the video game is not going to be completed by the end of 2019. Given his commitments, that will likely disappoint people. By the time many of you are watching this, it'll probably be 2020. Development still seems relatively slow, there are probably people impatient with the progress, but Yandere Dev at least has probably learned not to make promises he can't keep. There's no sign of the crowdfunding project yet, so I guess we'll see how that will be received in due time. The video game itself seems like an exhausting venture given Yandere Dev's desire to retain a lot of control. He clearly feels a commitment to finish it. He doesn't want to give up control given his investment. It's the sunk cost fallacy. He has sunk an investment in and he isn't willing to give it up or compromise easily on a creative vision in the hope that he will get there. And he might get there. At the same time, continuing this will undoubtedly be a draining endeavor, and I think it's a justified concern to posit whether the game will ever be finished given the scale and ambition. I'm not here to fully write anything off, and I don't think it's a bad thing to follow if you're just interested in watching the development, which I think is where a lot of his current audience stands. But I'd advise caution in investing. With the current trajectory, it's a risk you'd have to accept. The whole situation became weird to follow for me, because on the one hand, Yandere Dev seemed to acknowledge that the people who may be rather extreme in their behavior towards him were part of a small minority, and yet he dedicated so much time and attention to them, often causing a Streisand on the issue. He said that he was okay with criticism if it was delivered in a constructive way, but constantly censored public criticism regardless of tone, implying that he perceived even well-delivered criticism in bad faith. He acts like he wants to be out of the drama, but keeps involving himself in it. He constantly said things were taken out of context, but never really provided the context that would help his case out. I know it's a while back, but the example that still sticks out to me was the one regarding that clearly disgruntled fan who was annoyed about his mod. After going after him, Yandere Dev said he doesn't regret it on the corresponding Reddit post. In his debunked post, he said he often felt remorseful, but I don't think many people ever saw that. They just saw someone who was belligerent and arrogant. In reality, I think Yandere Dev was just so incredibly fragile over his public status that after the hostility backfired, he just went all out to suppress criticism. He's stubborn and a bit paranoid, and I don't think that's been to his favor, often ending up in conflicts with people in his own audience. As the hype slowed down and the Patreons dropped out, he became more frantic. Although the more public nature of Yandere Dev's involvement with drama has subsided, the censorship has not. There are a load of these situations, but probably my favorite was a post criticizing Corona-chan, oh god, being removed, with a person suggesting in the replies that they should just look to this other post for a more constructive way Way to communicate this criticism. But that post has been removed as well. It seems rather authoritarian, with the dev and his admins becoming more and more obsessed with tracking members' movements, including their participation in other servers and subreddits to read their intentions. It feels a bit like a cult, to be honest, and I'm not going to leave many warnings in this video, because enough information is out there for people to make informed decisions. But this sort of behavior is going to create a bubble which is bound to burst, and it's a really bad idea. But why is this bubble being created in such a way? My hunch is that Yandere Dev had trouble distinguishing between fans legitimately frustrated about the development of the game and those he would class as concern trolling. People pretending to care about the game's best interest but having slightly more negative intent. He felt that he was being targeted, and he probably knew that well worded yet more biting criticism would do more damage than anything else, so he tried to lump those people in with the harassers. The problem is that Yandere Dev often went for false positives rather than false negatives, which led him to lashing out and censoring people who may have genuinely cared about the progress of the game. 2015 and 16 definitely saw controversy coming from his own attitude. 2017 saw the exposure of certain technical failings, and 2018 saw an escalation in the arguments, frustration, and angst both sides had, amounting in an eventual burnout of the drama when the fans simply told him that enough was enough. Now in 2020, I guess we'll see how it all progresses. Do I think he's a bad person? 
I don't know. But I do feel his arguments regarding the progress of the game and his abilities were pretty poor. I also think his time management was exceptionally bad. I'm not sure if he knew they were or he genuinely believed that the game's complexity justified the amount of time he had taken on it. But if he'd spent half the time arguing that he was working on the game, well, working on the game, he'd probably get a lot more done. You have to accept that there will be people who will go out of their way to hate you. Does it make it right? No. Does it mean you should become equally invested in it? Also, no. I'd also say that a lot of people had completely valid quarrels with him, and although his intent may not have been outwardly malicious, it doesn't undermine the grief caused by belligerence, rancor, or any other behaviors that can be attributed to this curious character. I'd say it's probable that there were some people looking to stir stuff up, but it's only because sharks smell blood, and when some of Yandere Dev's behavior and responses started coming to light, they saw a guy who they could bait into lashing out and decimating his own image even further, and Yandere Ray Dev just could never understand that. You probably have forgotten when addressing his what's taking so long video, I said there was one other option that we'd get back to. Well, let's talk about it. Actually, I'll let Yandere Dev talk about it. Presently, Yandere Simulator is my full-time job. I get paid to work on it. As long as I'm getting paid to work on it, I feel obligated to pour every second of my life into it. As long as I'm getting paid for my time, it's perfectly fair for people to complain if I don't make timely progress on the game. But, what if I wasn't getting paid to work on it? What if I closed my Patreon completely? Then, I could downgrade Yandere Sim from a full-time job to just a hobby. I would have no obligation to work on it for any longer than I feel like working on it. I would have no reason to give it any more attention than I feel like giving it. I would finally be able to play video games and watch anime again. Nobody could call me lazy anymore. All of my problems would be solved. But, all of my fans would hate me, someone else would develop a Yandere-themed game to take the place of my game, I would fade from memory, and all of the work I've done over the past three years would be for nothing. It's tempting to downgrade Yandere Simulator to just being a hobby, so that I can take my life back, but it would probably be a one-way street with no turning back. Now, aside from the fact that he's playing Beethoven again, dude really likes Beethoven, it may be too late now. But in 2017, this was the best option in my opinion. This was the option that if I was a fan, I would have voted for. It's his choice, but if he's as pressured as it appears, passing it on wasn't a bad idea. I think the main concern is that it's a decision that he would not be able to revert. Maybe he wants to prove people wrong by finishing the game. But back then, I think a quarter of his audience understood. I tell him that he shouldn't listen to polls alone, but he went with the option that only 5% of the audience voted for, so I can't really say he did. Yandere Dev sees the source of his life in this community. That's the thing. There's more to this world than a community. I get there's a concern that you fade from memory. I get it too. But this is no way to be remembered. Yandere Dev and his game Yandere Simulator is the perfect example of a social media propelled video game when everything goes wrong. The obsession with hype over practicality, the motivation to keep it online, the lack of expert consultation, the lucky developer who was ill prepared and his volatile involvement with a passionate audience. It led to criticism which then snowballed and led everyone to lose out. And without his fan base just telling him to stop, it probably would have gone in the direction that he said it was going to. This current route seems to be less destructive, and I am grateful for that. But I wonder if he's really learned from his mistakes, or if he's just learned to hide the glaring flaws a bit better. Only time will tell. For now, he should be grateful that he has a relatively committed and open-minded audience. In spite of all the antics, he's still doing okay, and if I were him, I wouldn't take that for granted. For any other creators slash wannabe game developers, take this as a cautionary tale. Regardless of who you think is right or wrong, there's a lot that can be learned. Don't let Yushu drama cost you your life passion. It's not worth it. And don't think that everyone is out to get you, even if it may hurt. I hope the game is worth it. 
first things first, make sure you go and check out Faf9. He does great video essays on games. I love his work. He's got a great energy about him and he's such a lovely guy too. I can root for that big time. So definitely go and send him some love because he's done a great job here. You know, I can't thank him enough for coming in and filling in a gap that would have taken me a lot of reading to get to grips with. So thank you on that front. So yes, that was the video. I would like you to check out all the editors below. They've once again done a fantastic job and definitely, definitely check out the fantastic, fantastic work. Also want to give a special thanks to my Patreons. $10 plus Patreons are on the screen right now. And I need to give a special thanks to my $50 Patreon, some Hullabaloo, Caroline, and Hypercube. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. It means a lot. Got a lot of love for my Patreon $50 guys, girls, whatever. Very special thanks also to my $100 Patreon, Brandon, Be More Cool J, and Christopher Karras. Thank you so much for your contribution. It makes such a huge difference to the channel and to the progress that it's making. And it gives me a lot more mobility. So I really appreciate the difference that you're making. If you want to check out my Twitter, it's at The Right Opinion. Facebook, Right Opinion Official. Discord, there. Instagram, the dot right dot opinion. Very fantastic name. All those links will be in the pinned comments. And as always, my references that I use for the video are there too. I'm going to die. This was a long one. Thank you for your time.